already on the inside, the outside. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum. My name is Carson Curad. I'm a freshman at the college, and I'm also a member of the JFK Jr. Forum Committee here at the Institute of Politics. Before we begin, please note the exit doors on the Park Street side and the JFK Street side. In the event of an emergency, please exit at the exit closest to you and congregate in the JFK Park. Please also take a moment now to silence your cell phones. You can also join the conversation online with the hashtag JFK Junior Forum Live and interact with our student-run Instagram at JFK Junior Forum for behind-the-scenes behind the scenes highlights. Please take your seats now and join me in welcoming our guests and Institute of Politics student president Anna Duffy. Hello everyone, and thank you for joining us this evening at the Institute of Politics at Harvard Kennedy School. As the president, I have the distinct pleasure of welcoming you all to the historic John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum, a place for students to gather, engage, and learn from those who take the stage, from presidential candidates to emerging thought leaders to environmental advocates such as tonight's speaker. And now I turn to our special guests for this evening. Tonight, we are here for a discussion with Tatiana Schlossberg. In her first book, Inconspicuous Consumption, The Environmental Impact That You Don't Know That You Have, Ms. Schlossberg investigates how our, daily impact, how our daily habits impact the environment. From the internet to food to fashion and fuel, Ms. Schlossberg's book explores the tangible impact of our everyday consumption. A former New York Times science reporter, Ms. Schlossberg is a reporter who writes about the climate change and the environment. And leading tonight's discussion is Bob Cohn, a 2019 Fall Residential Fellow and the former president of the Atlantic. Mr. Cohn became president in 2014 after five years as the digital editor, editorial director of the Atlantic. And prior to joining the Atlantic, Mr. Cohn worked for eight years as the executive director of Wired and as a reporter covering the, the White House for Newsweek. So without further ado, please join me in, jo in welcoming Tatiana Schlossberg and Bob Cohn to the stage. Great. Great. Thank you, uh, Anna. Thank you very much. Thank you all for being here. Thank you, Tatiana, for being here. Thank you. Um, congratulations on this book, which uh, I found uh, fascinating and really interesting and a, a really useful journalistic guide to the um, impact of, of uh, environmental impact of, of um, my behavior and every consumer's behavior opened my eyes. So let's, uh, let's dive right in. You, you open by confessing that prior, to, uh, as you started the book, you, find, you found um, reading about climate change to fill you with dread. Mm -hmm. And then when you did read stories, you often found them boring. Yes. <laughs> so I'm, I'm wondering, uh, you began like this, in choosing this topic, like an uphill battle yes. to fight off the possibility that you're gonna generate either dread or boredom in your reader. Yeah, um, it's, uh, <laughs> it's not an easy assignment, but um, yeah, I felt, I, I, I don't know, maybe some of you feel the same way. Um, and also, thank you all for being here. I know it's a Thursday night, so uh, I appreciate that. But um, yeah, so I, I just never, I often didn't wanna read about climate change because it just made me so incredibly anxious because it felt like this huge inevitable problem that I couldn't do anything about. Um, and a lot of the writing, I think it's often been kind of siloed as a science story, um, which makes people like me who don't have a science background feel um, like we won't understand it. And so, um, and kind of feel alienated from it in that way. And so what I, as I became a climate and uh, environmental reporter, you know, not only did I feel kind of less anxious as I learned more about the topic, um, because I felt like, you know, I felt like a more, um, informed and, and responsible citizen because I felt like I understood the world that I lived in. Um, but also, um, 
and, and I hope that you know this book kind of helps readers feel the same way. But you know, I also realize that climate change is it is yes a nature and science and energy story, but it's really a story about everything. Um, you know, it's about health and politics and business um, and culture and history and people. Um, and so it felt really like an opportunity to get to write about everything, and that. Um, as hopefully not a boring person, uh, there might be room for some non-technical uh, journalism, which is really what I've tried to do in the book, is write um, not in kind of the technical or jargony language that we often see, but hopefully to make it more accessible to people who don't feel like they are science people, um, but really to find that there are so many ways into caring about this topic. Well, I, I experienced neither dread nor boredom, so uh, that, that, was, that was good. Um, it's such a serious topic, but you use a lot of humor and you really uh, avoid uh, being preachy. And I uh, ha have the distinct sense that that is your authentic voice, but it's also... Uh, uh, no, in my real life, I'm just lecturing and on the moral high ground <laughs> all the time. <laughs> but, but, it, it, uh, but strategically useful um, to, uh, uh, to get the reader to uh, sympathize and, and go, for your, go along with the ride when you're able to use humor and... and uh, not be too sanctimonious about the topic. Yeah, um, you know, I wanted people to feel, I mean, I I wanted people to feel like we were kind of going on this journey together where we're all learning about this topic because I think, you know, the reason that I wanted to write the book was because I wanted to answer a lot of the questions that I had uh, and I thought that readers might feel the same way and so hopefully, um, you know, by reading the book you will kind of go through that journey of learning about this topic and I also, um, you know, I'm not better than anybody else. Um, I eat a lot of ice cream. Uh, <laughs> so I'm concerned about my environmental impact in that way. But um, yeah, I, you know, I, I wanted people to not feel like they were already doing something wrong before they even learned about the book. And really that, um, you know, it's a, it is almost impossible to make sustainable choices given the system that we live in. And so um, and that's a problem. But, it, you know, we can't solve that problem if we don't understand it. And so that's why uh, I wanted to write it in that tone. And um, as for the humor, other than amusing myself, uh, <laughs> I, you know, I think again by putting um, this story aside as a as a climate as a science story um, or as a serious story, makes it really easy to separate it from our normal lives. Um, but I think we have to talk about it in the way that we talk about everything else. And I think also for people um, my age. And uh, I flatter myself that we're all in the same generation, but uh, <laughs> um, <me. Not> me. <laughs> um, you know, this is something we're going to have to live with for the rest of our lives. And I think it's important also to, you know, to not feel um, to scared and hopeless and feel like there kind of is a possibility for joy in figuring out um, these problems. And uh, I was really uh, very honored to um, that um, my book was in the New York Times book review and, and Bill McKibben wrote the review and um, really kind of amazed that he said there were things he didn't know, but he also said uh, he found the rates of cute CSI, the rate of cute CSIs per page to be diabetic. Um, so I apologize for giving Bill McKibben diabetes, but uh, you know, I, I did that on purpose because I do think it's important to make this, you know, to make this topic not just one that makes people feel scared because for me, fear is not a powerful motivator, and it doesn't make me in more interested in something. T to be fair, that's the only <laughs> negative sentence in the whole McKibben review. But it's the only one, it's the one I remember. Of course. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, and he's the dean of uh, climate and science yes. reporting, so yes. that, was, that was excellent. Yeah. W what inspired you to approach this topic through the prism of consumer behavior as opposed to uh, through the producers or businesses or governments or um, more on the supply side than the demand side? Well, I think... Um, you know, I, I think that in a lot of uh, climate journalism or the way that we talk about this conversation, uh, the way that we talk about this topic, um, there's kind of a, a mismatch in the scale. Um, it's kind of, you know, it's plastic bottles on the one hand or a complete transformation of the electricity grid on the other, you know, in less than 10 years. Um, and so it, it felt to me like I, there had to kind of be something in between those two things that might bring this down to the scale and the context of readers' lives. Um, and so it is, I think the entry point is all of our stuff and the things that we have. But I think it is actually, you know, this is n not a book about how our individual behavioral choices are gonna solve this problem um, because they're, they're not. Um, but really this is a book about how um, you know, these are problems that have to be solved on the systemic and structural level. And I think, you know, using all of the, the things that are 
uh, familiar and relatable to us and how they connect to climate change and connect people all over the world through these different supply chains was a, a kind of a lens through which to, to understand that and to see how all these things are connected. Um, but I do, you know, place, I think, in the book and definitely when I talk about it, um, the responsibility, you know, this is a change that needs to happen at the governmental and corporate level. Y you focus in the book, you take us on a, on a journey through four areas, the environmental impact of four areas, internet and fashion and food and, and fuel. So let me range across those topics for a, a few minutes and then we'll open up to questions. I, I want to start with fashion because I was um, surprised to learn just how bad my, my genes are <laughs> for the environment. And, and I guess it mostly comes down to chemicals and water, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the gene problem. Yeah, that's where it begins. Yeah. Um, <laughs> do you want me to yeah, explain tell that? Me, okay. tell I don't want to make everyone feel guilty here, but uh, if you're wearing jeans, you should hear this story. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was really surprised in general to learn about the um, impacts of the fashion industry, and I, pr I probably shouldn't have been uh, because I think it's an industry that, you know, touches plant and animal agriculture as well as um, mining and petrochemicals and forestry and, um, uh, you know, shipping. It's the engine of globalization and, you know, started kind of the... Uh, spark that started the industrial revolution. So it is, um, you know, it is this, this huge industry that involves millions of people all over the world, and we all also are involved in it by the stuff that we wear. Um, but the I wrote about denim kind of principally as a way to write about cotton, and um, cotton uses a, about 18% um, of the world's pesticides are, are used to grow cotton. Um, but even more than that, uh, the problem with cotton is the amount of water that it uses. So about 1% of um, fresh water on earth is available for us to use. The rest is ice. 70% um, of that we use for agriculture and about 3% of that we use for cotton. Um, so it really is a, is a tremendous amount of water and it's usually not used in a very efficient way. So, um, and, and the parts of the world in which it's grown are often places of high water stress. So um, the example that I write about in the book is um, the Aral Sea region um, in Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan and how um, in the 60s or, you know, in the time of the Soviet Union, they diverted these two rivers um, basically to irrigate this part of the world to grow cotton. And they were the, you know, among, the, I think, the top five biggest cotton producers in the world. But it's completely destroyed um, the Aral Sea. It's drained it so much that it's split into two seas now. Um, and in Uzbekistan, they're continuing to use it and actually starting to drill for oil um, in the seabed. And they've kind of done a better job in Kazakhstan to, to preserve what's left and it is starting to come back and there's still some, uh, there's now more fishing activity, but it's you know made the landscape incredibly salty um, and toxic because of all the chemicals and the lack of water. So, um, you know, there's still a lot of cotton that comes from there. So, you know, uh, it's hard to imagine that something that we're wearing kind of connects to those large ecological problems in, uh, Central Asia, but um, all of our, all of, I mean, that's kind of what the point of the book is, is to show that, you know, we are all implicated in these systems and therefore all responsible for fixing them. Uh, staying in, in fashion, there's this crazy stat in the book that we get, that 60% of the clothes we buy, we we get rid of within the first year. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think I've got t-shirts older than a lot of people in the room here. <laughs> um, but uh, and I guess at the core of this is the rise of fast fashion and the H&Ms and Zara's mm -hmm. of the world. So uh, uh, one connection I made when reading about that and also reading about the planned obsolescence that we all experience in you know, our, our devices, the mm -hmm. Apple products that come out every 18 months, you need a new phone every 18 months, is this sense in, in both those industries that, um, that the producers are creating a kind of a disposable culture. Yeah. Um, so t is that a connection y you see there? Yeah, you know, I think in, in general, a lot of these, I mean, the emphasis is, is on growth um, and especially those companies which are, you know, these enormous global companies that also rely on an expanding uh, global middle class to, to buy new stuff as much as it is, um, you know, people replacing their devices. And um, so, yeah, I, I mean, I, I hadn't made the connection, but I think it's all kind of part of this culture of, um, disposability and and buying new things, but the, you know, the the fashion one is is especially interesting because they're, I mean, you know, Apple is or whatever tech company is designing something for you to use and you could use it for a long time. Um, you know, these companies for the most part aren't they're making clothes that will fall apart, um, and 
you know, basically doing that on purpose. And so, um, and it's, you know, a huge amount of resources and energy and labor and, um, you know, health impacts for all the people who work in that industry to, to make these things that we really think of as, um, as really something to just throw away. And, and you talk about how hard it is to write about the fashion mm -hmm. industry and the business of fashion. Um, and and d d explain a little bit about why that was so difficult and what you, what you learned about the industry. Yeah, it was difficult just because it, there's not the same kind of scientific information available about fashion as there is about, um, you know, food or transportation or, you know, Bitcoin mining alone. Um, but, um, yeah, it's, a, you know, and I, I think m my suspicion is that it's something that's, you know, the women are interested in, so it hasn't been taken seriously uh, in terms of its, you know, enormous economic and environmental impact. Um, but it was difficult to kind of do an overall... Uh, exploration of the industry and so the way that I wrote about it was to write about a few different fibers mainly um, so I wrote about um, denim as we discussed um, synthetic fibers by writing about athleisure um, viscose rayon cashmere and then about fast fashion so uh, which is you know synthetics but also kind of the, the culture of disposability and, and the impact of um, throwing all these clothes away because uh, in the US 85% of the clothes that we throw away end up in a landfill or are burned. Um, so it's a, it's a huge waste source um, in addition to kind of all the, the resources needed to make it. So, um, so it, yeah, it was, it was difficult to be able to do that, but I think it was really interesting for me to kind of try to find ways around that limitation and to, you know, I got to kind of focus more on stories in that section of the book. It, it, it also seemed like in this section that um, it was a surprisingly hard reporting task because the companies were um, not very. Oh transparent. yeah, no one would talk to me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but even worse than like like oil companies. Yeah. <laughs> well, especially. I mean, worse in terms of their willingness to engage with yeah. the journalists. Yeah, and um, you know, I don't know why that is. Like one company, uh, Reformation. Um, they told me they don't participate in individual reporting projects, and now I see they're in like books and articles all over the place, so I don't really understand that. But um, yeah, it was, you know, especially these companies that kind of advertise themselves as being particularly green or eco friendly um, were really, really hard to talk to and just either stopped responding to me or didn't answer in the first place. Um, and maybe that's me, um, <laughs> but uh, I think it kind of speaks to this larger problem problem which is that there's really no transparency in the industry at all and um, you know whether that's kind of the company's practices or their supply chain and, and where they're getting their goods from because often they don't know um, and so they kind of uh, they won't take on accountability in that way and we haven't really made the demand that they do. So let's switch over to one of your other sections about the internet. Uh, you know, when it comes to internet, we usually talk about privacy, about mm -hmm. the extent to which our connected devices are spying on us in this Internet of Things, Internet of Things households we all live in. Uh, but you uh, are worried more about electricity consumption, and and uh, I, I take it that, from your perspective, that may be the hidden problem in in with all of our devices. Yeah, I think. Well, I don't know that I'm more I just I am worried about it and I don't think any it seems like not a lot of <laughs> other people are and we do hear about privacy all the time but I think right. um, you know in the internet you know, it uses about one to two percent of global electricity and is responsible for about two to three percent of emissions so it's not you know by any means the largest source of um, or largest user of electricity or source of emissions but um, it's growing so fast um, and the way that we use it is so much more energy intensive because of how we use um, how we use data and increasingly video. So um, one statistic that was really amazing was I wrote about a, a paper that was looking at the, comparing the energy efficiency of like streaming a video versus um, buying or renting a DVD, which involved the whole life cycle of that product. So, you know, it being produced, but also then the user driving to the store and all that. And so they found that in 2011, when this, the, the data was from, it was more energy efficient to stream video online, which is not surprising. Um, but in 2011, we watched 114 billion hours of, oh, sorry, we <laughs> gave it away the punchline. Uh, in 2011, we watched 3.2 billion hours of video. And in 2018, we watched 114 billion hours of video. So it really is this tremendous um, expansion of how, how much we're using the internet. And there are some, 
you know, estimates that depending on how it grows and how efficiency changes that uh, the internet could use anywhere from um, 8 to 24 percent of global electricity in the next two decades. Yeah, you had this statistic that, that Netflix currently accounts for 19 percent of um, electricity uh, uh, of internet bandwidth internet yeah, bandwidth yeah, in, in, yeah. The, in North America or yeah, in the US in, the, in North America in North and America. I think 15% um, globally yeah yeah so we're uh, uh, do you think you as you say about streaming video you would think well this is a boon because we're not we're not driving to Blockbuster and we're not um, uh, uh, creating Wait, plastic yeah. DVDs that have to go into landfill, but um, yeah, are we at the point where all that streaming is actually creating so much demand for electricity that it's offsetting the, the, the good part of not going to Blockbuster? Yeah, I think we're kind of reaching a point where there is that rebound effect that it's become so much kind of more efficient and convenient, therefore we're, we're using it more than we were before. Um, so I, th I can't remember the numbers, but I did a, I did a calculation in the book. Yeah. Um, so it, it's, it's in there. But um, yeah, and I think that's true of, you know, the scale of a lot of these systems, um, you know, things like the way that we use, the way that we order online, um, or, the, you know, the, the way that we watch video, or um, kind of all, all the different demands. The problem is often kind of how we use the system rather than kind of how the system is designed. Yeah, there was a similar trade-off you, you presented for e-commerce that, uh, uh, you know, I'm making fewer trips to the mall mm -hmm. in my car, but I'm, uh, I'm using more cardboard or I'm creating demand for more delivery trucks. Yeah. And uh, I don't know if there's a way to, to net that out and figure out. Uh, I mean, for me, it was just eye-opening because you imagine, oh, well, we're not driving to the mall anymore. Oh, and also, in the time that we save by not going to the mall, we're watching Netflix and, 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 <laughs> right. and, and, and creating <laughs> demand for electricity. Yeah, there was a study that looked at that, that like, even be, by not shopping, we're actually may be using more electricity just in different places. So in the home yeah. rather than in a store. But um, yeah, I think there has kind of been a lot of concern about the environmental impact of e-commerce. And I think that's partly because like the cardboard comes to us now and it used to just go to the store. Um, so it, they're actually like cardboard production over the last decade has stayed relatively constant, even as e-commerce has quadrupled uh, in terms of value. And um, which was, I, I was surprised to learn that. Um, but as consumers, we're much worse at recycling it than retailers were when they, and they used to get all the cardboard. So they recycle like 90 to 100% of the, their cardboard. We kind of top out at 25%. Um, so that creates another, you know, more demand for, for new cardboard. And then in terms of the deliveries, um, you know, FedEx or UPS, or they're much more efficient at planning a route to use the least amount of fuel possible to make all of their deliveries. Um, but if, you know, and, but if I kind of, if I want something in two days or next day delivery kind of throws a wrench in that. And um, so the truck might go out um, half full, um, well, half empty, depending on how you look at it, <laughs> um, to, to deliver my stuff to me um, rather than kind of doing it in the way that makes the most sense. And so, um, so it can cancel out some of those uh, those um, savings, which was was interesting. You know, it was like the, th the stuff that were offered kind of um, negates a lot of the the savings that that um, are possible. So, so, so you note that there's there's basically just two ways that we're gonna we're gonna reduce the uh, electricity uh, demand through um, all all of our technology use. One is to just literally limit the use, to, just to use less uh, 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 of our devices or to switch to renewables mm -hmm. and uh, over time. And I'm wondering um, how you see that transition going, what kind of progress we're making there? Um, it's, it's interesting. I, it's complicated, um, unsurprisingly. I think, um, you know, the other big piece of it is, is efficiency and the um, tech companies, um, it, this, so most of the energy use associated with the internet um, is, or electricity use is um, to power data centers, um, which have to stay on all the time and running to kind of send and receive information, but also they get really hot and so more electricity is used to keep them cool. Um, and so the companies that host a lot of our data are getting more and more efficient. Um, so, so that really helps. But, um, you know, the other option for them is to either build their own renewable energy facilities, which a lot of them are doing, or to um, enter into partnerships with utilities to add renewable energy to the grid. But the 
which uh, you know some companies are doing and Amazon for instance which so Amazon web services hosts or about a third of internet users say they visit a site hosted by Amazon web services every day so uh, it's a huge that's a huge part of their business and they Amazon recently uh, released for the first time their carbon footprint so we have more of a way of gauging how much actually of their uh, electricity they're getting from renewables but the the bigger problem with that is that all of these um, data centers have um, diesel generators or um, for the most part and so and and they're adding them really um, rapidly um, so in order for there not to be a service interruption in case like there's it's cloudy or not windy and so and diesel generators are really really dirty um, and produce a lot of um, black carbon and, and other pollutants in addition to just greenhouse gas emissions so I think that's something to to watch out for because they really try to not let anybody know that and um, you know Amazon wouldn't tell me what kind of backup generators they have um, just that they have them I was like well I don't care <laughs> that they have them I mean I do care but um, you know and Microsoft for instance has a, a lot of data centers in uh, Quincy Washington a town there um, and they have they have applied, I think, for something like 70 permits um, for diesel generators in, in that one town. So it's so that I think that's something to pay attention to. So, so let's turn to food. One of the topics you you, you go deep on. Um, you note that uh, so organic agriculture and buying local are two trends that uh, most environmentalists applaud. Uh, and you note that there may be some unintended consequences uh, in both of those uh, movements that might mitigate the positive impact that we think we're having on the environment. So let's start with organics. What's, what, what's, uh, why are they not fantastic? <laughs> well, I think, you know, organic has kind of become a shorthand for a sustainable, which often is um, useful, but a lot of the time, you know, organic means something other than what we think it means. And we think it means like a, you know, family farm with no pesticides, but it, you know, can be industrial. Um, and so that kind of, I think, contradicts, again, like our, our image of what an organic farm is. And, and also that, you know, the system of organics and the certification process around that was really developed as a response to soil, um, to soil health and water health and doesn't really kind of address some of the other um, impacts, particularly climate. So, um, but, so, so that's one part of it. The other part of it is, um, uh, you know, there are ways to kind of be sustainable and have a smaller environmental impact that aren't necessarily certified organic. So, you know, for an, I write about an orchard um, in Connecticut and they're not um, certified organic because they have to, they use some pesticides and it's almost impossible to grow an organic apple in New England because of the pest pressure and the mildew. And so, um, you know, they can get, they can basically pay to have um, surveyors come and, and work with this certification company to get um, this eco apple certification but that doesn't mean anything to consumers and so they can't charge more for them so they end up kind of paying for it twice in a way um, but uh, and then the other thing with organics is that you know the um, in terms of things like uh, water pollution and soil health and, and pesticide use they you know do much better but um, they have a much smaller yield. So per acre, you get you only get about 75% of the amount of food uh, that you do for conventional agriculture. And so, you know, currently about 1% of global agriculture is organic. Um, and if we were to feed the whole world with organic agriculture, we'd have to probably clear cut most of the world's forests. So, um, so there are kind of important considerations there. And I think, you know, as we look towards a world with nine to 10 billion people, it's, uh, we have to kind of think about um, I think we have to think bigger than kind of just these certification systems or these kind of smaller fixes and think more about how the kind of larger systemic and structural issues like how in the U.S., you know, 67% of crop calories don't feed people um, and, um, and, you know, address that so that, you know, we're using our most fertile agricultural land to grow food that people can eat instead of growing fuel and um, animal feed, which is a really inefficient way of feeding both animals and people. Um, and then in, in terms of local food, um, so I, I had, I felt like I used to hear a lot about like buying local and locavores and uh, I kind of stopped hearing about that. And so I wanted to, to make, sh to know what actually that meant and how big of an impact it had. Um, and it turns out that you have to be really, really good at eating local for it to make as much of a difference as basically just switching to one different form of, like from red meat to another form of protein um, or, no pro or no meat at all. Um, 
and uh, so, but, and that's because transportation is such a small percentage of the overall um, uh, energy use um, of, of food. And, but that's, so, in, so kind of perversely, it can be more efficient to ship food from like, to ship an apple from New Zealand to England than it is to have an, an apple grown in England and then stored and refrigerated uh, in England all year round. Um, but the problem with, um, with that is that it kind of accepts the system where um, where we do that <laughs> instead of kind of eating in the least impactful way, which is to eat um, seasonally and to eat locally. Um, right, the third choice is don't have an apple in the winter. Exactly, yeah. yeah. So that kind of seems like no longer an option um, or we have to have berries all year round and, and yeah. things like that. So, um, so that was kind of the issue there, which is like, yes, because we've decided that somehow that's cheaper because no one really pays for the actual costs associated with it. It is more efficient to grow food in Mexico and send it here. But, you know, that, that means that you're kind of accepting the system as it is. So one other question on food, and then we're going to open up to questions in a, in, in a minute or two. Uh, you, you mentioned corn, although not by name, but you talked about corn a minute ago, which in the book you call the greediest crop. And, and um, you know, we produce so much corn that creates this monoculture that's uh, bad for biodiversity. Um, and yet we continue to spur production of, of corn by giving subsidies to corn, corn growers and also to have, having ethanol mandates mm -hmm. um, for fuel, which obviously is, is, c contains corn. Um, so isn't our public policy making the problem worse yes. in this situation? <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, you know, I think kind of guaranteeing a market for, for corn in, term, in things like ethanol um, means that we'll always have, we'll grow more corn than we really need and can use. And it's not, it's not even like the corn that we would eat. Uh, so it's, it, it doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't make any sense, but you know, um, the problem is also that the first president, the first contest in the, uh, or the first, you know, event in the presidential primary is in Iowa and Iowa's mostly corn and has lost 99.9% .9 of their native tall grasses to corn. So, um, you know, it's would not be popular to go to Iowa and campaign against corn. And so I think, you know, that's one of the many ways in which some of these in, uh, inefficiencies are kind of built into our system. Do you think if Iowa wasn't the first, we, we didn't have a, a, a caucus in Iowa that right off the bat, then we, we would actually not have a, such a negative impact <laughs> on biodiversity <laughs> across the country? Well, it's probably not that, that simple, but I do think that doesn't help because, you know, no one is, it seems like no one's really willing to take that on. And obviously there are, you know, other um, built, uh, states in the Corn Belt, and that's you know an, the farm lobby is incredibly powerful. And um, but I, I do think that you know like nobody is going to say no one really says that, and um, that would be a place to say it. Every conversation in uh, at the Institute of Politics has to turn to Iowa caucus at some point. Right. So <laughs> sorry about that. Um, you talk in the book about the climate paternalism of developed countries, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, so how do you think about the tension between this urgent need to reduce global emissions and this understandable uh, desire and equally urgent need for developing countries to improve their economies, which is invariably is going to lead to more emissions? Right. Yeah, it's really it's really complicated. And I think, you know, fundamentally, climate change is a justice issue. And I, justice, um, I think, is one of the, the threads that runs throughout the whole book. But, um, you know, I write in the book about air conditioning, um, because, you know, in the, in the US, we have like 90% penetration of air conditioning across the country. And, um, you know, it has uh, and we're kind of now striking these international agreements, hopefully keeping them in place to um, limit some of the really powerful warming chemicals um, that I that are used in coolants, um, which are more expensive. And we're doing that at the time that much of the rest of the world um, that's much hotter than the U.S. can afford and needs air conditioning. Um, and so it seems like very unfair to me for you know us to be saying, well, you can't have air conditioning, but we already have it. And so therefore, that's fine. Um, and I think that, you know, it's really important as we, you know, think about international policy and think about, um, you know, these global responsibility that we, that equity really features um, prominently in those conversations because we are the largest historical emitter of greenhouse gases. And, you know, if we're not um, taking responsibility for that, um, 
you know, it lets everybody else off the hook. But, um, and, and it's true, you know, so far we have not been able to decouple growth in GDP from growth in greenhouse gas emissions. Hmm. Um, and so there, that's, you know, why like China's growth or India's growth is people are worried about how many more emissions will arise out of that. Um, and I think that that's all true. It's a major concern, you know, for China in particular, like we have a role in that because we buy a lot of the stuff that China is producing. Um, but, you know, globally, I think it's it's a kind of narrow understanding of what growth is because it's really only looking at one thing um, and that maybe kind of having a more um, holistic idea of, of what success is and what growth is or else putting a price on carbon would, would help both those things. So if you have uh, questions, you might uh, go to uh, the microphones and I'll turn there in a moment. I have plenty of questions, um, but I'd rather hear from you guys than from me. So feel free to avail yourself of those um, over there. And there might be some right there if anyone needs to use those. But I want to ask about um, more, one more question on the, on the fuel chapters here. Um, so if we're not watching Netflix or wearing denim or wearing yoga pants, we're, uh, we're, getting, uh, we're, we're getting an Uber or a Lyft. We're ride mm -hmm. sharing, right? And uh, on the one hand, you think that is uh, on the bad side, that's going to dampen use of mass, mass transit mm -hmm. because uh, to the extent that you might have been taking uh, mass transit instead of an Uber. Um, uh, on the other hand, it's probably reducing um, personal car use as well. So um, how does it all net out? Has anyone done any work on that to figure out? Me. You have work. done that work. <laughs> Perfect. Um, no, well, it, I, I wanted to, to, to look into that because, it, you know, I feel like a lot of the ride um, hailing companies were advertising themselves as like, transforming transportation and ending dependence on personal car ownership um, and you know that they were like that everybody was sharing their uber pool and um, basically like nobody takes an uber pool <laughs> because even if you re request an uber pool uh, only 20 percent of the people match with somebody else so basically it doesn't really uh, matter um, but it also you know personal car ownership has grown as um, you know ride hailing apps have grown um, and uh, in New York City, so New York is one of the places, one of the only cities that has um, required these ride hailing companies to, uh, to submit their data. And in New York, you know, since Uber has been there, which is, um, I think since 2014, they've added almost a billion driving miles to the roads. And so um, people are taking more cars. There are many, many more cars in New York. Um, and, you know, there's, I think went from like around 30,000, um, you know, for higher vehicles to now like 104,000. Um, and most of those are affiliated with at least Uber. So, um, so I, th I think, you know, it's one of these many areas that we're, you know, now kind of catching up to the idea that like tech, you can't just put technology out and then expect everything's going to go really well <laughs> that, um, you know, people like, I'm sure the people in this room need to be thinking about um, policy and planning and, and how people actually use the things that we're kind of de deploying at mass scale. Isn't this the point where, where someone usually asks whether you really met your husband in an Uber pool? Yeah, and I so regret putting that joke in the book. <laughs> uh, I wrote, because Uber is always like, saying in all their ads that like their spouses who met in an Uber pool. And so I wrote like, I did not do this. And I footnoted my wedding announcement because I thought that was funny. And then I wrote in the acknowledgements like to my husband, George, whom I met in an Uber pool. And now everybody asks me about meeting my husband in an Uber pool. And um, I, I, sorry, no, no, <laughs> it's, it's my own fault. It really is teaching me a lesson. Um, but yeah, no, I, we met in college. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, we'll have to take that story out of Uber's, yeah, PR, out, yeah. out of Uber's <laughs> PR machinery then in that case. Um, great. Okay, I think we have some questions over here. Uh, so uh, y your name and your Harvard affiliation and, uh, and a question would be great. Thank you. Hi, my name is Manat. Thank you so much for being here and for your work in this area. Um, I'm a sophomore at Harvard. Uh, I'm studying economics and government. Uh, I'm a little bit curious because I think I completely agree that the progress in our world is going to be driven by large governmental and corporate organizations. And so I'm really curious about your thoughts um, as someone who has tried to take small steps in my own life to try um, to be more climate friendly. What are the incentives for individuals uh, to continue taking those steps? If truly at the end of the day, we really need a lot of the bigger organizations to take those steps first. Right. Um, that's a really good question. And, you know, I think 
I, what I want the kind of overall message of the book to be is that, you know, we don't need to feel individually guilty, but that we need to feel collectively responsible for, for building a better world and for fixing these problems. Um, which is not to say that like, therefore you can take Ubers and eat meat with abandon, but, um, but, but more to say that, uh, you know, that it is, there has been too much emphasis placed on the consumer to make the right choice. And, um, and I think, you know, that narrative of personal responsibility has been destructive in a lot of ways because it's kind of taken the attention away from those who are actually responsible. Um, but I, you know, I think that those things are all really good as a place to start. It's just that it can't end there. And, it, and you know, and we can't kind of be satisfied with our own personal behavior because it just, it's not enough. Um, and I think, you know, for me, I, I do the, the, you know, I've made the changes to my behavior that I have because, you know, it's hard to acquire new information and not act on it. And I want to be the kind of person who lives in line with my values. Um, and I think, you know, if we understand the sacrifices that we're making we and why they matter, we may be more willing to make them. And so, um, but it is, it is really tricky. And I, you know, I just, I want people also to like not sweat the small stuff. <laughs> and, and I think, you know, the most important individual action, um, is to vote and is to get involved in the political process and to put pressure on companies or not support companies that aren't at the very least transparent. And so, you know, those are also important individual actions too. Thank you. Anna. Hi again, um, my name is Anna. I'm a junior at the college. And my question is, so I think with the elections, uh, climate change has increasingly become part of the dialogue, but it doesn't yet seem to be something that people are voting on. And particularly with the electoral being older than per se like my generation um how do you think that we can get to a point where climate change is like a hot button voting issue yeah it's interesting because people say that they care about it as their number one issue but then like if they have to pay more they it, <laughs> they don't support climate policy like we saw in a lot of the state elections um in the midterms um but you know i think there was a lot of kind of hand wringing about how there was no climate question in the last debate. Um, and you know, of course there should be a climate question in the debate, but also like every question should be about climate. And I think what the, the most important thing to do is to, um, help people understand and help politicians understand that this isn't an issue that can be separated from other issues. This involves everything. Um, and you know, like healthcare, uh, a question about healthcare, that's an answer about, that's a question about climate change. A question about justice is a question about climate change. A question about agriculture, or, you know, any of these things is, um, is a question about climate change. And so I think understanding for helping the electorate understand the centrality of all of that. And, and also I think, you know, climate change has been such a divisive political issue and so aligned with one particular party um, that it is it can be difficult to talk about climate science without alienating people um, but I think you know you can talk about climate change with the, without talking about climate science um, if you kind of talk about how you know the same things that are the same companies or practices that are responsible for climate change are also responsible for higher rates of asthma um, and, and you know particularly in communities of color and low-income communities um, or, you know, how if you're a farmer, you know, whether or not you believe in climate change, like spending a lot of your money on fertilizer, that doesn't do you any good. And it ruins, you know, the, that unites the farmer in Iowa with the Gulf, fisher, Gulf fishermen as well. And so I think kind of explaining and exploring how the system doesn't work for anyone, um, hopefully will be an important way to do that. Is there someone in public life, maybe one of the presidential candidates who you you believe is thinking in the right way about these topics, about the environmental impact of our actions? Um, you know, I think that the, um, the way that the Green New Deal and, and all that has changed the conversation around climate change in terms of, you know, whether or not like a federal jobs guarantee is the way to do it, but, you know, understanding that infrastructure is, you know, part of the climate change conversation and, um, and work and food and healthcare, that, that, those, that those things are all connected, I think is really important. Um, and so, you know, I, I appreciate that effort to, to, to move that conversation in the right direction. And I think, um, you know, I really liked um, Jay Inslee's climate plan and that, you know, that he was a, a climate president, a climate uh, candidate was um, inspiring to me. It's unfortunate that it, only lasted as long as it did, but um, I thought it was, uh, he did a really good job and has had a really good set of policies. Yeah. Great, yes, thank you. Thank you so much for coming. Um, I'm coming over from the business school and 
you've talked a lot about the system and like accepting, are we accepting how it is now? Like, how should we change it? From a business leader perspective, is there anyone who you think is doing a great job that would be a role model for future business leaders to look up to and how they're incorporating that into their job? Mm -hmm. And if not, what do you think is the most important question for future business leaders to be asking themselves? Because although everything should be about climate, if you only had to make one thing about climate, what would it be from a business perspective? Um, you know, I think uh, like Patagonia is a really great company and they've managed to grow and be incredibly successful while also doing things like um, advertising not to shop on Black Friday, <laughs> but, you know, also, you know, that people can bring back their stuff and get it fixed and, um, you know, and encouraging a, a consumer loyalty that I think probably is really helpful to them. Um, Unilever, the former CEO of Unilever, um, who I think stepped down last year, but he did an interview recently um, in the New York Times uh, about, like, because I guess he was offered to be CEO of Kraft or something, or yeah, at the same time that he was offered to go to Unilever. And um, Unilever, they focused on sustainability and um, like benefits for employees, and they grew like much faster than um, Kraft over the same time period, which was kind of doing all the uh, the opposite things. So, um, so that was an, an interesting example to me. Um, and I think uh, for, I guess, to, for business leaders to keep in mind, you know, I don't know a ton about business, <laughs> but I'm a journalist. Uh, so clearly, I didn't make the smart financial decision. But, um, <laughs> but I think. Um, and I know, I, I don't know, I guess not kind of looking at everything on the quarter model and probably kind of having a longer view about what um, what the company's responsibility is to the consumers and workers and um, like how to kind of um, scale that over time. Um, you know, I think the things that are good for people are also good for the planet usually. Um, and so making sure to... Um, to address those things and and what the again yeah what the I guess what the impacts are kind of over over the long term and maybe not thinking only about growth but thinking about kind of um, you know what are the other costs associated with um, with whatever it is that you're producing you know it's like it's cheaper to produce something in China and ship it to the U.S. because no one really pays for the costs associated with doing that whether that's like ocean acidification or port pollution and all these different things so you know I mean a lot of that could come from putting a price on carbon but a lot of that could also come from these companies having a different understanding of what their responsibility is to their different markets and their consumers. Okay. Yes. Hello um, I'm a student at the college my name is Miu. Um, we talked a bit about the inequalities about who, who climate change targets, um, but I'm also interested in the inequality surrounding who can become a climate activist. So in terms of everyday um, environmentalism, you mentioned how maybe stepping away from dairy, the ice cream. So if you choose almond milk over regular milk in your coffee, it's like an additional amount. Mm -hmm. um, for, also, if you want to go on a climate march, it's protest is easier for some people more than others. So how do you propose lowering the barrier of entry for climate activism? Yeah, it's a it's a really good question, and it, you know it comes up a lot because, um, particularly in terms of talking about clothes, because that's an area and and food also where like the more sustainable option is more expensive. Um, you know, I think that a lot of the time the the cheaper option, like H and M, isn't cheap because they're trying to clothe people who can't afford, <laughs> you know, better made clothes, um, and so and and there are um, so and and I, I guess what I what I think about that is you have to make those changes at the corporate and regulatory level because it shouldn't be on the consumer to have to spend more money to be able to be sustainable. The choices should all be sustainable. Um, and so I think, you know, like light bulbs is a good example of that. Like if you remove incandescent bulbs, um, like if you don't sell them anymore, no one has to make the choice about like an incandescent bulb or, or a different light bulb. Um, and, you know, some of that may be um, reflected in price, but I think also, like, if we are spending, if we're not burning fossil fuels, w there's less fossil fuel pollution. You know, people don't, people can, uh, they don't have to spend that money on, on healthcare or their, you know, 
they can buy food that's healthy that prevents other kind. So it basically just these these things are all connected. But it is a it's a really good question, one that's really difficult to solve. I guess you know the other piece of it is that people who can afford those things are typically people with bigger carbon footprints, and so they have a responsibility to um, you know to act proportionally and um, take maybe take that on for other people as well. Hi, uh, thanks so much for being here. Uh, I'm Julian. I'm a graduate student at MIT. Um, so you've spoken a lot about uh, kind of the corporate and government responsibility and how that's going to ne be necessary in large-scale change. Um, but I guess I'm kind of wondering what your perspective is on whether or not um, success in fighting climate change is going to require consumer behavior change. Or I mean, you can imagine a world in which, say, all electricity is renewable and everyone uses the same amount, or we all use less because of some other structural change, but our lifestyle may be different. So I was curious about how you think about balancing those those two. Yeah, you know, I think um, probably we all will have to consume less. Um, and But I also think um, it's much harder to get 300 million people or 7 billion people to do something that it, you know, rather than kind of limiting what the options are that they have. Um, and they're, you know, it, yeah, like it's, you're not, it's going to be difficult to get everyone in America to be a vegetarian. So um, if that's the case, then you also have to kind of adjust the system and change the incentives. Um, but, you know, I do think it is important that people understand that we're going to be living in a world that looks really different from the world that we have been living in, or maybe we won't, but future generations will. And it's, you know, we do have to kind of make plans for that. Um, and some of that might mean kind of changing what we think of as normal. Um, whether that's like the amount of meat or dairy that you eat or with the clothes that you buy or how much electricity you use. So, I, I, you know, I do think, or, you know, taking a car, I think like... Uh, reducing, you know, personal car ownership is probably, would make a huge difference. Um, but that requires investment in public transportation, which ultimately is something that happens that, you know, governments do. Um, so I think all these things kind of have to happen at the same time. But I, I do think kind of bigger changes, I mean, they don't just happen, like we have to make them happen. Um, and that's, I think, the, where at the moment, you know, the most important individual behavioral changes have to be. I think we have time for a few more. Let's go over here. Yeah. Hi, my name is Will. I study nutrition at the School of Public Health. And I was curious what questions you uncovered while writing this book that you'd want to tackle in the sequel. Oh, that's a, <laughs> that's a good one. Um, and people keep asking me what I'm going to do next, and I don't know. So um, <laughs> um, I think, no, it's fine. <laughs> it's fine. Um, I also know Will. We went to college together. Um, but I I think one of the things that I'm, uh, really interested in is, um, and it, it, you know, it connects to this book in a lot of ways. One of the, I guess, like why we as, you know, consumers kind of give away so much power and why, what makes us do that and why do we do that? And the area that I think is sort of the most interesting is thinking about utilities because there are these incredibly powerful organizations or sometimes private companies. Um, we all use them and we let them do whatever they want. <laughs> and um, there's so little accountability. They're often kind of the most powerful political interests in, in a particular state. Um, I mean, you can see what's going on with PG&E in California. It's, people feel like they have no recourse and the, comp and the utility is not going to pay for the damages because they're bankrupt, but everybody's still dependent on them. Um, so that's like, a, I think, a really interesting question for me is, um, and, you know, because utilities produce so much pollution, it connects to environmental justice in, in that way. So I'm kind of interested in um, in that and kind of how we got to this point where we're, we're willing to kind of give away so much of our power for for our electricity when really like, I mean, we should, I mean, we, we, we use electricity like it's water, <laughs> but we let private companies control it so um, often. So I think that's a, a question that I have. Yes. Uh, hi, I'm a Carson. I'm a freshman at the college, and I wanted to ask if you've discovered anything in your career or research for your book that was really striking and memorable to, be, to you as like really unfair or uh, really hope inspiring or just really bizarre. Uh, all of the above, all the time. Um, I, um, you know, one of the things that there's a, a chapter in the book about. Um, uh, coal ash pollution, which is the byproduct of burning coal for electricity. Um, 
you know, it's one of the it's one of the largest solid industrial waste streams in the U.S. We produce more than 100 million tons of it every year. Um, it contains lead, mercury, arsenic, cadmium, selenium. Uh, we store it m mainly in water next to power plants where it can um, seep into groundwater or um, pollute rivers and lakes, or if it's in a landfill, like blow away and get into people's lungs. Um, in 2008, there was a huge um, spill of this toxic slurry um, in Tennessee, and it kind of released billions and billions of gallons of this stuff into a, a river and buried 300 acres of land. Um, the the waste was carted away to a landfill outside a predominantly black community in Alabama. Um, the workers who cleaned it up weren't given any protective equipment, and so they actually just won a lawsuit. But you know, I think about a dozen people died, and 200 more were made sick by exposure to this pollutant. Um, and it's one of the largest environmental disasters in American history. It happened in 2008, and I never heard about it until I became a climate and environment reporter. Um, and you know, it's. Uh, it's a luxury to not have to know what that is, and it was um, a very profound um, discovery for me because, you know, as a privileged white person living in New York City, I don't have, I don't have to think about it. Um, but there are millions of people who have to think about it every day, and um, you know how it affects their health, and you know they're disproportionately um, uh, communities of color, low-income communities in rural areas, and so um, that was, you know, I think. I like to think of myself as someone who thinks about justice and um, thinks about equality and um, and kind of waking up to that particular aspect of this made me feel like there's so much about this that I don't know and so much about this that feels so deeply unfair. And, um, you know, I think a society that allows that kind of um, disparity in opportunity um, is, a, is a country that's less free and less just for all of us. And so... Um, it's a topic that I try to write about all the time. Um, mostly, no one wants to let me, <laughs> but um, but I'm trying. Um, but you know, it's a these are the kinds of things that are really important to pay attention to because um, you know Andrew Wheeler, when he became EPA, admi EPA administrator, it was his first um, act was to get rid of the regulation governing coal ash, which had only been in effect since 2015. So you know. Um, like we, we have to pay attention to those kinds of things because like clean air and clean water doesn't just happen um, and you know if if we don't then you know yes disasters like that can happen but there's also you know kind of the low level pollution that some people live with every day so um, I know that wasn't like a fun answer about a surprising thing I learned but <laughs> but I do think it's it's really important Thank you. yes Hello, my name is Lilia Malachuk. I am U.S. Uh, Department of State Professional Fellow here from Ukraine. Uh, my question would be um, collective consumer versus individual co uh, consumer. Uh, on collective, I mean government and all uh, uh, governmental institutions, uh, hospitals, uh, all uh, the governmental uh, uh, schools. Um, did you uh, uh, research and pact uh, what uh, uh, go uh, governmental institutions has on climate, uh, uh, on uh, um, having its uh, uh, operational, uh, using uh, uh, paper or uh, procure uh, some uh, services and goods from different companies, and what kind of uh, uh, new policies uh, uh, governmental institutions should introduce in order to be an example for mm -hmm individual consumer also uh, to change uh, its behavior. Yeah, you know, I didn't kind of look at that specifically. There were some places where it came up. So, um, I, you know, for instance, like I didn't know that a lot, that the government hosts a lot of data with Amazon. Um, that's recently been in the news because now they've decided to host some of it with Microsoft. But um, so there, there were areas where it came up, but it wasn't something that I looked at specifically. I, I mean, I, again, there were, you know, like I, when I was talking before about diesel generators, like, you know, hospitals have those and airports have those because they need those backups too. And kind of currently they can't run without that, that kind of stuff. Um, and I know that um, there has been kind of at this, at the city and state level there in some places, there has been a big effort to kind of be more efficient or be more green or kind of switch their um, like municipal vehicles to electric. Um, so, so I think those are some of the, the policies that they can do. Uh, I mean, that that um, governments or institutions can have. I mean, 
I think a lot of universities responding to students' concerns are becoming more efficient or having, you know, an office of sustainability and stuff like that. But I think, um, you know, it does come down to some of the things you mentioned, like, um, you know, entering into partnerships with utilities for renewable energy or electrifying their municipal fleets and, um, you know, also like having their buildings kind of in line with the most efficient um, policies and things like that. So those are probably the, I mean, the, the same things are true for governments and institutions as are for, for the rest of us, but it is, they should be leading by example for sure. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna take the last question. We're here in a, in a school named for your grandfather and of course, politics has long been in your family, but also writing and journalism has long been in your family. So can you talk about um, uh, anybody in, in the family whose who's writing and journalism inspired you to get into this in the first place and um, to write this book? Yeah, I, um, you know, I, I am very proud to be a member of my family um, and I am proud to be from a family of writers because Everybody emphasizes the politics, but um, my grandmother was a reporter. Um, obviously, my you know my grandfather wrote books um, and speeches, and um, my mom is also an author. And um, you know she wrote a book about the Constitution, um, where you know kind of using cases to illustrate each one of the amendments. And I think. I didn't make the connection at the time, <laughs> but I think that's kind of what I've tried to do is demystify this topic that um, seems kind of complicated and abstract, but really is so important to all of us and, um, and that we interact with all the time. Um, I think for me personally, you know, one of the ways that I've connected with my family is by studying history. Um, and I studied history as an undergrad and also as a master's student or graduate student. Um, and, you know, I think kind of wanting to learn about my family made me want to learn more about American history in general and kind of really sparked um, my curiosity in that way. And, um, you know, for me, as a graduate student, I read a lot of environmental history, which um, kind of made me realize that, uh, you know, climate change may be an especially intense um, uh, um, problem, and, um, but we've been dealing with versions of it for as long as people have been interacting with their environment, and especially in this country. Um, and so kind of understanding this issue in the context of history um, uh, makes me feel, you know, connected to, to my family in that way because I do, because um, that's sort of where my love of history started. Great. Well, Tatiana, thank you very much for your work and for being here with us. Thank you for tonight. having me, and thank yeah. you so much. Thank you.